people of the country and the honor. There we go. Now we're recording. So. Um, so there, there's this compact between the people of the country and the monarch, um, his or herself. Um, the, the coronations follow a very familiar pattern going back a thousand years, but the monarch can choose his or her, her, his or her own, um, their, their own way of setting up their coronation. So they can add elements, they can delete elements as they see fit. So it's somewhat tailored to each monarch. I said that legally you did not have to have a coronation and actually the only aspect of the coronation that's required by law today is the coronation oath. And this is the oath that the monarch swears to govern the people of the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth realms according to their respective laws and customs. Um, that's the only thing they absolutely have to say during the coronation. So it's a, it's a celebration of a new reign. Um, and with, as with many, many, many uh, royal celebrations and, and royal ceremonies that we see in Britain, there's a lot of theatrical uh, elements to it involved as well. Today, they're state affairs. Um, so they're paid for by the government, unlike royal weddings. Um, they're paid for by the government. Uh, the ceremonies take months to plan, not surprisingly. Uh, they, they involve the royal household, government ministers, of course, the Church of England, as I said before representatives of the commonwealth realms, and of course the monarch, because he or she does have a, a say in how the whole thing plays out. And there's a special coronation committee that's set up, that's formed to kind of oversee the planning for all of this. So the title of this talk was British Coronations from William I to Charles III, but we're gonna start a little earlier than William. I want to go back to, although it was not the first coronation, it's the one that we have the earliest written account of. Um, and this is the coronation of King Edgar, who reigned from 959 to 975. He was an Anglo-Saxon king. He came to the I don't know why that's still doing that. All right, we got a problem here. Okay, hopefully that stopped. All right, um, he was only 16 when he came to the throne. Um, you can see him on the left here. He looks like he's doing a little twerk dance. I'm not sure what he's doing. He looks quite happy. Um, but he had his coronation in Bath, so it was not in London. Um, but from the earliest times, as I said, this ceremony was a, a combination of religious and secular rituals, and that goes all the way back to Edgar. Uh, his, uh, what we know about his coronation comes to us from a monk who was writing 25 years after Edgar's death. So we're not sure if that monk was really contemporary with if he was really there when, when Edgar, Edgar was crowned king. But he did say that in the year 973, um, Ed, Edgar pulled together all these archbishops and bishops and abbots and religious people. And he wanted the most reverend bishops um, to bless him and anoint him and consecrate him by Christ's leave. So that's where we got the earliest religious element that we know of, a uh, written element that we know of. And on the right here is just the plaque um, uh, on Bath Abbey uh, showing where he was, not the current abbey, but where he was um, crowned king. But that does take us to the first person um, on our title, uh, William I, William the Conqueror. He came over from Normandy, which is now modern day France. He co conquered England in 1066. And he began the tradition of holding coronation ceremonies at Westminster Abbey. And to date, there have been 39 coronation ceremonies at reigning monarchs at the Abbey. King Charles is, uh, will be the 40th. Now, at the time of William's coronation, the Abbey was brand new. It had been built by Edward the Confessor. And William was crowned there on Christmas Day, 1066. William had died in January of 1066. So he barely saw his, his Abbey completed before he died and was buried there. And then December 1066, uh, William was crowned king there. Now there was a king in between, there was a King Harold in between um, Edward the Confessor and William the Conqueror. But William the Conqueror, I don't have time to go into the whole history of what happened between those two. Suffice it to say, William came over, William conquered, Harold was gone. And so we believe that, that William wanted to be crowned in the Abbey by way of saying, look, I really am the successor of Edward the Confessor. That's why I'm being crowned here. His, his tomb is in here. Um, I am, I am his, his real successor. The Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, the head of the church who usually did these coronations, he refused to perform the coronation. He said he would not crown one who was covered with the blood of men and who was the invader of others' rights. So the Archbishop of York came and did the, the service instead. 
Uh, one interesting thing that happened during William's coronation, um, you had French speaking Normans from, from you know, now modern day France, Normandy in the, in the Abbey to see this event. And you also had English speaking Saxons also in the Abbey to see this event. And when they shouted their affirmation and approval of William as King, which is part of the coronation ceremony, there were Norman soldiers, French speaking soldiers posted outside of the Abbey doors. And they mistakenly thought that the cheering and the shouting inside was an assassination attempt on their new king, on, on the Duke of Normandy. So they got all riled up and I don't know why, but they started burning houses around the Abbey. They started retaliating. They thought these feisty Anglo-Saxons are going to kill our, kill our king. So they started burning houses around the Abbey. The church became filled with smoke. The congregation got scared. They went fleeing from the church in the middle of this coronation. Um, it was said William, who feared little, was actually sitting there trembling, but at the same time, he was urging the, the archbishops and bishops and everyone to say, finish this, finish it, you know, finish the coronation. I've got to be king. So he didn't want to stop the coronation. Meanwhile, there are riots going on outside. There are fires burning, um, but he did get through his coronation and he did make a solemn promise to treat the English people as well um, as the best of any of their kings had done before them. So he was trying to make concessions to the people, but he had quite a uh, fractious uh, um, coronation service, wasn't calm, shall we say. Now, since the late 14th century, every coronation ceremony has basically followed the same order of service laid down by this beautiful book. This is a beautiful uh, medieval illuminated Latin manuscript, um, the Liber Regalius, which means royal book. It was written around 1382, and it's basically kind of a how-to manual on how to run a coronation service. So it has a step-by-step -step guide to the actual event, the words that must be spoken by the new king or queen, the music that should be included. And it was, it was used pretty much chapter and verse for all subsequent coronations up to James I in 1603. At that time, the liturgy was switched to English. It was translated into English. There are still elements that are used today from this book um, for coronations, but up until 1603, it really was the you know how to for dummies, how to run a coronation. This manuscript can be viewed in Westminster Abbey in their library. Um, it is quite beautiful to look at. And also in Westminster Abbey um, is one of the key pieces um, of the coronation which is St. Edward's chair, also known as the coronation chair. This has been the centerpiece of coronations for over 700 years. It was made by order of Edward I, King Edward I, hence the St. Edward's chair. Uh, it was built between 1300 and 1301. It's, it's made of oak. Uh, it's decorated with patterns of birds and foliage and animals on a gilt background. Now you can see on the left, this is what it looks like today. It's actually undergoing some restoration right now uh, in the lead up to um, King Charles's coronation. The, the guild lions you see at the bottom, those four guild lions, they were added in the early 16th century and then they were replaced in 1727. So they don't date back as far as the chair. Uh, and on the right, what you can see here is an artist rendition of what the chair would have looked like in its day. And it's absolute glory with all the gilding. Uh, it would have had a seated king painted on the back of it. You can still see, if you look very, very closely, um, the foot of the king. Um, so you can see what it would have looked like in its time. And I wanted to point out under here, um, you can see this open space, which we didn't necessarily, uh, the grill work is in front of this one, but you can see the open space. That's, and you can see here, what was in the open space. Uh, the Stone of Scone, also called the Stone of Destiny. For centuries, this was associated with the crowning of Scottish kings. But in 1296, it was taken from Scotland. It was brought to England. Um, and it was placed under the, actually, in early medieval times, the kings, when they were being crowned, would actually sit directly on the stone. And then later, it was put in this little alcove under the throne, under the chair. Um, and they sat atop it, not right on top of it. But the stone weighs 336 pounds. It's basically a rectangular block of pale yellow sandstone. It measures 26 inches by 16 inches by 11 inches. It's huge. And it's decorated with a, a Latin cross on the top. 
On Christmas morning, 1950, it was stolen from Westminster Abbey by Scottish nationalists. I don't know how the heck they got something this big out of the Abbey without being seen. One assumes they must have done it very, very, very early on Christmas morning. Uh, and they took it back to Scotland because they said, hey, it's our stone, the English shouldn't have it. Four months later, it was recovered. It was brought back to the Abbey. But in 1996, under the government of the then Prime Minister, John Major, it was decided uh, it really should belong in Scotland. It's Scotland's stone. It's, it's connected with their coronations and their royalty. So you can see it at Edinburgh Castle um, now. But part of the agreement was that um, Scotland would loan it back to England for their coronations. So it should be making its way, if it hasn't already, back to London for the coronation of um, King Charles III, as far as we know. That was the agreement that was made in 1996. All right, I'm gonna jump ahead now uh, in, in history timeline and go to the Tudors. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about this guy, Henry VIII. I'm not gonna talk a lot about his coronation, but I am gonna um, talk about one of his wife's coronations. He was the son of the first Tudor monarch, um, uh, Henry Tudor, uh, later Henry VII. Uh, Henry VII came to the throne by invading England and defeating Richard III. Now, uh, he had royal blood coursing through his veins, but through illegitimate lines on both his mother and father's side of the family. So it was really important to the Tudors, Henry VII and his heirs, to project this image of legitimacy and power and sovereignty. Um, so all of their coronations were always about, again, showing that I have the right to rule, just as William the Conqueror did. Uh, so this, this was very, very important. And there was no better way to do this than at a coronation ceremony. So what you see here is Henry VII's son, Henry VIII, um, with his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, on the left here. Uh, Henry was not quite as old and, and heavy as he uh, looks in this um, this image when he married Kat, when he and Catherine were um, crowned. But on the right here, you can see an etching, and you can see Henry on the left. He's sitting under the Tudor rose as the crown is being placed on his head, and on the right is Catherine, and she has her badge, um, the pomegranate, which was the uh, sign of fertility um, over her head as she's being crowned. Uh, unfortunately for Catherine, the fertility thing did not work out so well. She she had some miscarriages. She did give Henry a son who died when he was only, I think, 50, 53 days old, um, had some miscarriages, and ultimately only gave um, Henry one daughter, which leads us to um, Henry's second wife. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the coronation of queen consorts. Um, the consort refers to the marriage partner of a ruling monarch. Now there have been prince consorts, right? You had Prince Albert who was married to Queen Victoria. Most recently we had Prince Philip who was married to Elizabeth II. They never have coronations of their own because, and they're never called king. They're only ever called prince. And the reason for that um, and why that differs from the female um, consorts who are called queen when they marry a king is because a king always trumps a queen regardless. So you could not have a King Philip or a King Ar uh, Al Albert because that, that uh, person would trump the actual reigning monarch. So you couldn't do that. But queen consorts did have their own coronations. They were not ruling monarchs. They were married to a ruling monarch, but they did have their own coronations. If they were already married to the monarch when, um, when the monarch was crowned, then they would have a kind of a side-by-side -side coronation. Uh, a smaller little segment of the coronation would be devoted to them. If they were not married um, when, when they came, you know, if their husband was already king, in other words, when they married, then they would have a separate coronation on their own later. And that was the example, that was the case of this woman on the left, Henry's second wife, Anne Boleyn. Anne's coronation was actually very lavish um, and very unique in two ways. Henry had been obsessed with Anne for years. Uh, she was a very controversial figure at the time of her coronation. She had displaced Henry's very beloved first wife, Catherine of Aragon. The people loved her. They loved her daughter, Mary. Uh, so they were not at all happy that, that Anne was seen as this strumpet that came along and was um, you know, destroying this marriage and, and marrying Henry. She was also pregnant at the time of her coronation. 
And there was some supposition, we don't know exactly when they married. So there was some supposition that she was already pregnant when she married him because they had a secret wedding. So we don't know when they married. Um, but again, Henry went out of his way to make sure that Anne's coronation was totally over the top, as lavish as could be, to really, again, send the message that this is my right, she's got the right to be queen. She is my rightful queen. So the Tudor chronicler, uh, Edward Hall, gave us a very detailed description of Anne's procession from the Tower of London on the way to her coronation. Now, in medieval times, um, all of the monarchs would spend a couple of nights before their coronation at the Tower of London. It, we think of it as a prison, but it was also a royal residence, very sumptuous royal apartments there. So they'd spend a couple of nights there. Then they'd have this very grand procession through the streets of the city of London on their way to Westminster to be crowned. And Anne did this as well. So she was at the Tower of London, had this very elaborate procession, tons of people and ladies in waitings and bishops and people on horses. And, and on every street corner, there was a pageant going on, um, sort of these tableaus and these pageants with music and theater. And you can see here on the right, this is a, a sketch from um, the court artist Hans Holbein, very famous artist during his time, a sketch for a tableau that he was designing for Anne's coronation procession. What makes hers really unique, however, is she was the only queen consort to be crowned seated in St. Edward's coronation chair. That's only for the reigning monarch, only the reigning monarch sits in that chair, never a queen consort, but she was seated in that chair. And not only that, she was crowned, and we'll see this later when we get to the regalia, she was crowned wearing St. Edward's crown. That is the crown that is placed on the monarch's head at the moment he or she is enthroned. Again, never, ever for a queen consort or a prince, con well, prince consort doesn't have a coronation. So this was highly unusual. And again, it was seen as Henry's way of saying she is, at this time, <laughs> she didn't last that long, equal to me. She has, she's legitimate. She has every right to be sitting here and being called Queen Anne. So very, very interesting uh, and different. So Anne also did not give Henry the son that he wanted. And in fact, like her predecessor, she had um, a few miscarriages. And like her predecessor, she gave him only a daughter. But in this case, this daughter was a knockout daughter. I mean, one of the most famous monarchs in British history, Elizabeth I. And if there was anybody who knew all about how to project image, it was Elizabeth I. I love this um, painting and obsessed with this painting of Elizabeth in her coronation robes as a young woman. Her procession from the tower mirrored that of her mother's. Um, and in her case, she kind of had a compromise between a traditional Catholic ceremony and a Protestant one because she was a, a firm believer in what we call the new faith. Now, when Cath when um, when Henry divorced Catherine, he wanted to divorce Catherine. The Pope would not allow him to do this. Henry ended up breaking with the Church of Rome. Um, he still pretty much held to the Catholic teachings and beliefs, more or less. He didn't really go full hard Protestant Reformation, but his daughter did. And her mother was a, a believer in the, in the new religion, um, and, and so was Elizabeth. But Elizabeth was trying to play it both ways. She was trying to appease both sides of the, the country, the, the Catholics and the Protestants. So she was crowned in Latin by a Catholic bishop, but part of her service was read twice, once in Latin and once in English. So she also brought in a little bit of the Protestant elements to that. So that was the first time, even though it wasn't until James that we actually, James I, that we actually saw the liturgy go totally to English. Um, Elizabeth started bleeding a little bit of that into her service as well. So I mentioned James I. Uh, James I was actually James VI of Scotland and I of England. He was the first of the Stuarts. Elizabeth died unwed and without direct heirs. She was called the Virgin Queen for a reason. So James VI of Scotland became the first king of a united Scotland and England. Now he became king of Scotland when he was only 13 months old because his mother, Mary, queen of Scots, she was Henry VII's great granddaughter. Um, she was forced to abdicate the, the Scottish throne and he became king. But then uh, he was the next in line basically um, in terms of Elizabeth because she had no direct heirs. And again, there was this bloodline through Henry VII. So he became the English king in 1603 
And it made him the first Scottish king to be crowned sitting on that stone of scone that we saw earlier, the first one in over 300 years, because it had been stolen from Scotland. So now he was sitting on, actually more than 300 years, he was sitting on that, on that stone um, as both the king of Scotland and the king of England. And this is him in his coronation robes. Um, in the background, you can see Banqueting House, which was part of Whitehall Palace, a major, large Tudor, Stuart um, royal residence at that time. Moving along to his son, um, I'm sorry, his grandson, um, Charles II, uh, he came to the throne uh, after a period that saw his father, Charles I, executed for treason in 1649. And then you had an, an interregnum period after Charles I was executed of about uh, 11 years, give or take, where there was no king. There was a Commonwealth government. But after a time, again, I don't have time to go into it here. I will be talking about Charles I and Charles II next month. So if you want to hear more about that history, come to that. Um, but after a time, um, the, government, the government and the people said, bring the monarchy back. You know, maybe we were wrong. Bring the monarchy back. So Charles II, who had been in exile in France, he came back to England. He was invited back to England to become king. But before he had his ceremony in England, his English ceremony, he was actually had a, a Scottish coronation in 1651 um, because the Scots were very upset by this interregnum government. And they said, hey, uh, this guy's our rightful king. You know, you killed his father. Um, he should have the right to rule. So they gave him his own Scottish ceremony. Again, he had Scottish blood in him, obviously, uh, in 1651. But he subsequently did go over to France and he hung out there until he was invited back. He came back uh, and had his coronation in 1661. What's unique about this was during that interregnum period uh, when there was no monarchy, Oliver Cromwell, who was the Lord Protector, kind of the guy in charge, if you will, he had all of the, almost all of the coronation regalia melted down and used to fund the new government, used to make, made into coinage and other things or sold off. So the crown, all the things we're going to see later that we associate with coronations, those were all destroyed. They were melted down. So when Charles II came back, everything new had to be made. So what we see today in the coronation ceremony, and we'll see this a little later, all dates from 1661, with the exception of one item that I will show a couple, there's actually a couple of items that remain, but one item in particular I'll show you that still remains from the medieval regalia, but everything else dates to Charles II's coronation in 1661. And in fact, they made the new St. Edward's crown. I mentioned St. Edward's crown that Anne Boleyn was, was wearing. Um, this crown made in 1661 has been used for every coronation since that, um, since 1661. So going further ahead, um, Charles II died without any heirs, any issue, and he was succeeded by his brother, James II. James was the last Catholic king. Um, ever since Henry started this whole battle with Rome, uh, there were, there was infighting between the Catholics and the Protestants. Catholics were not looked on fondly as monarchs. They didn't want, uh, Catholic monarchs. James was the last Catholic king. He was, again, a son of Charles I. Um, and Parliament finally turned to this guy on the left, William of Orange. He was a Dutch Protestant, and he was married to James's daughter, Mary, on the right here. They were also first cousins. So William's mother was the elder daughter of Charles I. So again, he had a very strong legitimate claim to the, to the throne. Uh, and they had basically, it was a bloodless revolution. Uh, they came over, it was called the Glorious Revolution of 1688. Uh, James did not lose his head. Um, luckily, he just, he, he took off. Um, he was dethroned and he took off. Um, the interesting thing about these two, about William and Mary, is they were actually joint rulers. So Parliament didn't go to William and say, hey, come on over and be our king and bring Mary as your consort. Um, they both had very strong blood claims to the throne. So they said, both of you come over and be our monarchs, be our joint monarchs. So when they had their coronation, it wasn't the, man, it wasn't the monarch and his queen consort. It wasn't the queen, um, you know, and just having her husband tag along. They were both joint monarchs. 
So they needed to have um, another special ceremony because there was only one coronation chair, right? Uh, there was only one set of regalia. Mary needed her own regalia. Mary needed her own coronation chair. Here is Mary's coronation chair. It looks almost identical to St. Edward's coronation chair. Uh, you can see the graffiti on it. This is unfortunate. It's also on the coronation chair on St. Edward's coronation chair because in Victorian times, uh, you could just walk into the cathedral, plop yourself down on the chair, carve your initials in the chair. This chair is in the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Gallery in uh, Westminster Abbey, uh, upstairs uh, in Westminster Abbey. So you can see it there, but as you can see, it's very similar. Uh, it looks almost identical to the uh, coronation chair, St. Edward's chair. So they had a joint coronation, which was very unusual. We've never seen that um, before or since. And then that leads us to the Hanoverians or the Georgian period. So Mary died childless a few years after their coronation. William continued to reign on his own. Uh, he died in 1702, but again, no direct heirs. So first the crown passed to Mary's sister, Anne, uh, Anne had multiple pregnancies, but unfortunately, um, none of those panned out. She died without a living heir in 1707. So then we bring in the Hanoverians or the Georgians. The Georgians take their name from the first four kings who were all named George. So when Queen Anne died without an heir, the crown passed to her German second cousin, George Louis of Hanover, and he became George I of England. And uh, his mother was a, a granddaughter of um, James I uh, of England, uh, James VI of Scotland and I of England. So that was his link to British monarchy, to the British throne. He didn't speak any English, barely spoke English when he came over, hated being in England, wanted to be back in Germany, really didn't love his gig as king, but here he was, he was, he was the chosen one, so he came. And as I said, there was a succession of Georges after that. So the next one that I wanna talk about, um, Probably of the of the four Georges, probably one of the ones we're most familiar with is George III. He lost the American colonies during the uh, War of Independence. Um, and following the death of George III, his son, who had been Prince Regent, he became George IV. Now, by the time he became king, he was 57 years old. And he had been ruling as Prince Regent for almost 10 years because his father, George III, it had a sharp deterioration in his health, both physically and mentally. So George IV had been really ruling on behalf of his father for quite some time as the Prince Regent. George IV was known for his very extravagant tastes and his very exuberant lifestyle. And his coronation in 1821 is an excellent example of this and just what his appetite was for self-indulgence. And you can see him here with his coronation robes and the crown next to him. He was, he was the original dandy, I like to think. This guy loved to bling it out, loved to dress up, loved to spend vast amounts of money on furnishings and you name it. So here's his procession. <laughs> he spent the equivalent of $26 million in today's money on his coronation in 1821. Compare that to his father's, which was closer to 2 million. Now his father was, was very economical. He was called George the farmer, uh, but still huge difference in these two coronations. And a significant part of this budget went toward the costumes uh, that were worn by the participants in this procession. George's coronation costume, he had this extravagant 16 foot silk velvet and fur robe. And you can see it here, while it says it's being carried by eight page boys, they, they kind of look a little older than boys, but eight sons of nobles. And in the very back is his master of the robes. And they were told, spread this out. When you walk, spread it out because I want everyone, George wanted everyone to see the elaborate embroidery on here. He was very, very proud of his, of his robe. Now, after the ceremony, there was a coronation banquet that was held. Uh, and again, this dated back to medieval times. These were big, fancy affairs. Uh, everybody would come, they'd have a big banquet. Uh, but in George's case, it was quite funny too, because he was he, he came into Westminster Hall. That's where the banquet is. So there's this very long, long, long aisle down the middle of the hall. So he's walking down the hall 
And he's got these attendants, these pages, and they're holding a canopy over his head. And this was very, very common during coronation ceremonies and, and other ceremonies that the monarch would have a large canopy over their head going partway down their back, um, you know, big canopy. So he's got these attendants, they're holding the canopy over his head. But George was upset about this because he kept walking ahead of the canopy because he's like, no, 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 no. People attending the banquet can't see my glorious robes. And then the poor attendants are trying to catch up with him because they're mortified because they've got to keep the canopy over the king's head. That's what you're supposed to do. So they're rushing to catch up with George. George is rushing to stay ahead of them. And one spectator said it basically looked like a foot race as they're all kind of racing up the aisle to, um, to get there first. And especially since George wanted to show off his, his fancy robes. And he was not a small guy, despite what this picture looks like. So that must have been, um, that must have been quite a sight to behold. Also connected to George's ceremony was um, this person. She was notably missing from his coronation. She was his wife, Caroline of Brunswick. He had been long estranged from her. He treated her very, very poorly. Um, and for many years, he wanted a divorce from her. But he had a lot of his own adulterous relationships. And so he was told, yeah, don't do that. That's going to put a bad light on you. She was po pretty popular with people initially. They didn't meet until the day of their wedding. They did not get along at all. Um, they had one daughter who, who tragically died uh, in childbirth when she was young, but they, um, they never got along. Um, and, and Caroline actually went back to the continent to live at, uh, at some point because they just, they were not hitting it off. But when she heard that George was now king and he was having his coronation, she's like, I'm still his wife. I should be able to be crowned alongside him. So she came back to England. Uh, she tried to gain entry into Westminster Abbey by several different entrances. Every single one was blocked. She did kind of blot her copybook, if you will. She lost some sympathy with people because she was screaming and yelling and pounding on the doors and they thought this was not, she wasn't showing uh, the proper decorum. She did not get into the Abbey, needless to say. And sadly, she, she fell ill the very next day and died only three weeks later. But um, that was George's scandal. He's in there with all his glorious clothing and he wants everybody to, he's preening. He wants everybody to look at him. And there's this woman outside screaming and pounding on the doors to get in. And then we get to Victoria. Um, we're gonna jump ahead now to the Victorian times. Uh, so on the 28th of June, uh, 1838, she was only 19 years old. You can see this painting of her enthroned. She was crowned uh, queen. And of course, she was also inheriting a growing global empire at this point. And this is a painting by George Hayter. He was her painter of history and portrait. She had an official painter of history and portrait. And this is quite a, a lovely photo. You can see the peers taking off their coronets to hail her as she is enthroned and crowned queen. Now, her day started out really well. She had a procession to the Abbey. It was the longest procession since Charles II, since 1660. Uh, Charles II was the last one to have a procession from the Tower of London. After that, uh, they, they no longer went out to the Tower of London, but she had a very long procession. The route was very densely lined. You can see in this painting here, there was scaffolding put up, packed with people. Tens of thousands of people came into London to see this coronation of this young, beautiful queen. Uh, all the windows were occupied. Everybody was on the rooftops. It was a big, big deal. And there's a, a, an invitation to her coronation. But the ceremony itself was filled with mistakes. Uh, and and uh, the historian John Guy actually referred to it as the botched coronation. And indeed, there was a lot going wrong in this coronation. It was believed this was due in part to her predecessor, uh, her uncle, William IV. Again, another brother um, in that line. So he was George IV's brother. Again, no heirs. Uh, and he had a very scaled down coronation. In fact, he had to be talked into having a coronation. He was the total opposite of his brother. He did not want any fuss or fanciness. They called it the penny coronation because he spent so little money on it. But because of that, he was partially blamed for not leaving a template for Victoria. We had that medieval template that we saw earlier, but there is no modern template for her to follow in terms of what does a, in quotes, modern coronation look like? How do you blend the modern and the medieval together? 
So it was considered to be kind of this awkward patchwork quilt of a service. But the other thing that really nearly sunk it, and this was not William IV's fault, was there was no rehearsal, no kind of rehearsal. Remember, I told you it takes months to plan these coronations. They're highly orchestrated. Um, they've got the religious aspect. They've got the secular aspect. There are certain traditions you follow. They had no rehearsal. There were no instructions given to everyone who was attending, the hundreds of lords who were attending and what they should be doing. The staff at Westminster Abbey who were performing the coronation, they had no instructions. And even it was said, even the new queen herself did not visit the abbey until the evening before her coronation. So as she entered the abbey, we are told, her train bearers um, who were carrying her train, just as we saw with George, uh, they were wearing small trains of their own, but they couldn't control their own trains while they were holding hers. So they kept tripping over their own trains, which was not a good look. And one of them said, this in turn meant, in quotes, we carried the queen's train very jerkily and badly, never keeping step as she did. So they were kind of weaving and tripping as they went up the aisle. And another spectator commented, the effect of the procession itself was spoiled by being too crowded. There was not enough interval between the queen and the lords and the others going before her. So you had all these people bunched up, basically going up the aisle together. I mean, I remember way back when I got married, they even made, made us practice how many steps between, you know, the maid of honor and you and this and that. No, they were all just bunched up going up the aisle together. Uh, the Bishop of Bath and Wells, meanwhile, he turned over two pages of the service by mistake uh, during the service, and that threw everybody off because suddenly he skipped a page. The Archbishop of Canterbury was to place the, the um, which we'll, look, we'll see later, the um, coronation ring um, on the queen's finger. Well, he put it on the wrong finger, and it, the, the ring was too small for the finger he was trying to put it on, and he forcibly shoved it onto this poor woman's finger, just jammed it onto her finger. And when it came time to remove the ring, she said she did so with the greatest difficulty, and at last did so with great pain. And basically, she had to place her hand in a bowl of ice water to get the ring off. So you've got these stumbling maids of honor coming up the aisle. You've got these bumbling bishops who could do nothing right. <laughs> and then you've got a tumbling peer. Actually, it was one peer, not peers. A tumbling peer. And it's this poor guy. Oops, let's see here. This poor guy, aptly named Lord Roll, of all things. So during the homage, um, if you saw back in that first painting, the queen is sitting kind of on a raised dais and there's steps coming up. So during the homage, the priests, the lords of the land, they all come up, they swear fidelity to the monarch, they kneel, they swear an oath, they kiss her hand. Well, this poor guy, Lord Roll, he was 82 years old. And as he was advancing up the stairs, he fell. And Victoria recalled poor old Lord Roll, who was dreadfully infirm and attempting to ascend the steps, fell and rolled quite down. When he attempted to reascend them, I got up and advanced to the end of the steps in order to prevent another fall. And she got a lot of praise for, for doing that, for kind of breaking her royal tradition, getting out of the chair and, and meeting him. But this led to a, a section of a poem by uh, Richard Harris Barnum, um, Mr. Barney McGuire's account of the coronation. Then the trumpets braying and the organ playing and the sweet trombones with their silver tones, but Lord Roll was rolling. Twas mighty consoling to think his lordship did not break his bones. So luckily he was, <laughs> he was not injured in the fall, but that must have been pretty embarrassing for him. Uh, Victoria's coronation lasted five hours. Uh, many of the participants, like the bishops, heralds, ladies and waitings, they all had to stand for those five hours throughout. They didn't have chairs to sit in. And at one point, um, Sir Robert Peel, who was the leader of the opposition party at the time, he reportedly fell over because he fell asleep standing up. So hers was not without uh, controversy, well, not controversy, not without a lot of, uh, a lot of blunders. Okay, jumping ahead a little further um, into the modern, more modern era, we see George V here. Uh, he was king from 1910 to 1936. You can see him here with his very statuesque wife, uh, Queen Mary, with their um, coronation regalia and clothing. But what I wanted to talk about was not his British coronation, but something that happened in India. So in the days of the British Raj, um, during the British Empire, 
There was always a celebration or a durbar. Durbar means court of a ruler in Persian. And they always held one of these to mark the coronation of a new emperor, emperor or empress of India, which of course the monarch in, in Britain was. So Mary and George actually attended this, this Durbar. They were the only monarchs to ever attend the Durbar in person. This was in December of 1911 and they, they attended. And you can see them here in their full regalia, even though it was very, very hot that day. Apparently they wore their robes. Um, now, the crown jewels were not allowed to be taken out of Britain. So there had to be a new crown made, and this is the Imperial Crown of India. It was designed by the crown jewels, uh, jewelers, Gerards, uh, specifically for this event. You can see that it has a silver frame. It was laminated in gold. 6,100 diamonds are in this crown. Uh, there's also emeralds, sapphires, rubies. Now, the king wasn't crowned at the Durbar. He, he came in wearing the crown along with <laughs> Old coronation robes, um, but he, he won't remember this. And Mary herself, she also got a special um, diadem commissioned for her to wear at the Delhi Durbar. Again, you can see diamond scrolls, platinum. Uh, there were emerald spikes, which you can't see. They're not in this photo, but in the coronation photo or the Delhi Durbar photo, uh, there were emerald spikes that could be taken out. Mary loved her jewelry, loved it to pieces. So she had this design so diamonds could be taken out, diamonds could be added in, different gemstones could be taken out and, and put in. Um, she eventually passed this on to um, Elizabeth, the, later the Queen Mother, uh, Queen Elizabeth II's mother, and then the Queen Mother gave it on to her own daughter, Elizabeth. So here they are, um, and you can see the, the, um, the spikes at the very top. Uh, it's in black and white, unfortunately, but the emerald spikes um, that Mary is wearing at the Delhi Durbar. And then Queen Elizabeth II, she never wore this crown her, or, or wore this diadem herself, but she did take two of the largest stones in it. These were two diamonds um, that were taken from a 3,000 carat stone that was mined in South Africa back in 1905. And they're often put in and out of these, these various... Um, tiaras and crowns and things. She took two of those and she made them into a brooch. And she's wearing, you can see her wearing the brooch here at her diamond jubilee in 2012. So one of those stones, uh, one of those diamonds, the Cullinan three is 94 carats and the other one is 63 carats. So that's a whole lot of diamonds. And that leads us to Elizabeth II's parents, George VI and his wife, Elizabeth. Now, George was never meant to be king. He came to the throne after the abdication of his older brother, Edward VIII. Uh, Edward gave up his throne to marry the American divorcee, uh, Wallace Simpson. Edward had actually already been king for almost a year at the time of his abdication. So his, his um, coronation ceremony planning was well underway. In fact, they had already made coronation souvenirs. I've got a couple of them actually uh, showing that, you know, his coronation date, but it never happened, obviously. Uh, and as a result, on May 12th, 1937, which was actually the very day that Edward VIII was supposed to be crowned king, George VI was crowned king alongside his queen consort, Queen Elizabeth. Theirs was the first coronation um, to be filmed. Uh, it was not shown on television, but it was shown in movie theaters. Um, and it was the first to be broadcast on radio. And I can share that link with, I have a link of the coronation um, ceremony of George VI. If anyone's interested, um, I can share that with the office. They can send it out. Again, if you want to come to the four hour, uh, the course that's starting next week at Lifelong, um, I have more information on George's coronation and the blunders that happened during his own coronation. Uh, and I also have a short reading list, which I can also share with you guys, the, the reading list and the, the videos as well. So again, several missteps. Actually, I can talk about a couple of these now. The Dean of Westminster fell down some steps while he was carrying King Edward's or St. Edward's crown. Uh, one of the bishops stepped on the king's train. Another put his thumb over the words of the oath that the king was about to read so he couldn't read it. And again, it was a very long service, so long, in fact, that um, many of the more elderly peers fell asleep in their seats, including one guy who was supposed to be writing an account of the coronation for a newspaper. He fell asleep during the service, so who knows what, what he made up. Um, 
Now, at the time of the coronation of George VI, um, the future Queen Elizabeth was 11 years old. Her sister, Princess Margaret, was seven. So they attended the coronation. They got their own little robes, their own little gowns, and their own little coronets, which you can see here. And there's the family looking very serious after the coronation. And on the balcony, looking a little happier. And George had his own crown made, his, his own uh, imperial state crown. So what happens is during the coronation, at the moment of the crowning, the enthroning, um, the St. Edward's crown is placed on the monarch's head, but this thing weighs five pounds, it's really heavy. So it's usually switched out for a lighter crown that's worn out of the abbey when you process out of the abbey. And that's the um, imperial state crown. And everybody can have their own imperial state crown. Many of them have had their own. Uh, so this is the George VI imperial state crown that was made for him to wear out of the abbey. And another one of those, um, Cullinan diamonds, part of that um, huge 3,000 carat diamond that was cut up into smaller diamonds. Another piece of it is there. And here are the tailors working on George VI coronation robe. He had his own coronation robe made for his coronation. And the future queen left us this beautiful little, um, she wrote about a five page little booklet for her parents on the coronation. And I just love this to mommy and papa in memory of their coronation from Lilibet by herself, by herself. Um, I'm just showing you the last page. And I just wanted to read a little bit about this. She's talking about when she came back from the coronation, her parents came back, they were greeted when they came back from the Abbey. And she said, then we all went to the balcony where millions of people were waiting below. After that, we all went to be photographed in front of those awful lights. When we sat down to tea, it was nearly six o'clock. When I got into bed, my legs ached terribly. As my head touched the pillow, I was asleep and I did not wake till nearly eight o'clock the next morning. So this is very sweet, this, uh, her memory of the coronation and writing this up for her parents. And then we get to Elizabeth herself. So I wanna turn our attention to Elizabeth. This was the last British coronation um, in the lead up to her sons. Um, Hers lasted nearly three hours. Actually, it was actually, I think a little over three hours. It was quite, again, the production from finish to start. There were over 8,000 guests from 129 nations. It took months and months to plan, six months in advance to plan. And the Abbey was closed for quite a while during that time. She did have rehearsals, eight rehearsals. 200 people were involved in building the tiered seating for the guests. Um, the ceremony had a 60 member orchestra, a 400 strong choir. 27 million viewers from the UK uh, out of a, about 36 million population watched the ceremony on television. It was the first one televised. Uh, there was controversy about that. Some people thought that was not um, the thing to do, that people could sit in pubs and they shouldn't be sitting in pubs drinking beer, watching the Queen crown. But it was the first televised coronation. A lot of people bought their first television set just to watch this coronation. Uh, and um, it, they, they, they said it was also watched by many, many people around the world, about 20 million people around the world. And it cost about $45 million in today's money. So it was quite the coronation. Here is a very bored looking little four-year-old Prince Charles um, seated between his grandmother, the queen mother on the left, um, George VI's wife, Elizabeth. And on the right, his aunt, uh, Elizabeth II's um, sister, Margaret. He doesn't look too impressed by this, this whole ceremony. But he did get his own very sweet little invitation. So this is his own hand-painted special invitation to his mother's coronation that Prince Charles was given. So the ceremony itself, there's, there's several steps to it. There's a public procession to get to the Abbey. There's a procession into the Abbey. There's the recognition of the oath, the investiture the homage, and then the procession out of the Abbey. So I wanna talk about a little bit of those quickly. I know we are gonna, like I said, I knew I was gonna run over. Um, so here was the procession route that uh, the queen took to the Abbey, started from Buckingham Palace, a long procession so everybody could see her. She rode in the state, uh, the gold state coach, which was built in 16, uh, 1762 rather, sorry. 
Uh, this has been a regular site at coronations, at jubilees, other celebrations. It's been used at every coronation since George IV in 1821. We told you he liked his bling, as you can see here. It's not really solid gold. Um, it's made of guild wood. And so then it has this thin layer of gold leaf over it. And the interior has velvet and satin. It's huge. It's 23 feet, 23 feet long. It's almost 12 feet tall. It weighs four tons. It needs eight horses to pull it. And because of how old it is and because of how heavy it is, it can only be used at a walking pace. So it takes a long time to get anywhere in this thing. I actually, I got to see it in 1977 um, during her Silver Jubilee, but I was quite a way back in the crowd and you, you could still see it. It was just so big, it stuck up over everything. But then a few years ago, I went to the Royal Muse at Buckingham Palace and got a closer look at it. So here are a couple of photos. And you can see it's um, really quite elaborate. And the wheels themselves are, are just huge. Okay, so on the journey to Westminster Abbey, the queen wore George IV's state diadem that was made for his coronation in 1821. Um, so she wore that into the Abbey. Uh, she went on to wear that for the state opening of Parliament throughout her reign. So that, that got worn a lot. And she wore this beautiful dress designed by Norman Hartnell. Um, he is the same man who made her wedding dress. Uh, she gave, he gave her eight or nine different designs before they finally hit on the one um, that she chose. And over that, she wore the robe of state. Um, this is also referred to as the parliament robe because it's worn at the state opening of parliament. You can see it's a long crimson velvet train. Um, it's got gold lace, handmade gold lace, and it's lined in ermine from Canada. And then it has an ermine cape you can see over her shoulders. Now, this is obviously not her coronation. This was uh, during one of the state openings of parliament, but I wanted to give you an overhead view of what it looked like. And here she is getting out of that, that coach, arriving at the Abbey. So she comes in, she's formally introduced to the congregation by the Archbishop of Canterbury. And then they face the East, the West, the North, the South um, to be introduced. Then she is seated in the chair of a state, not, not St. Edward's chair, but the chair of a state. And then the congregation, she recognizes them and they respond by saying, God save Queen Elizabeth. She then recites the coronation oath on the right here um, that incorporates a pledge to uh, govern with law, justice and mercy. And then there is the religious um, oath on the left as well, um, being a faithful Protestant. I'm going to uphold the Protestant you know, succession. She does that as well. Then we get to the act of consecration, the anointing, which I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. The, in the past, the monarch was regarded as chosen by God to rule. So their coronation ceremony had several features similar to the consecration of a bishop, including the anointing. And this is the most sacred part of the coronation. And it's the only one that's not tele uh, televised or photographed at all. Um, her robe of state, her diadem, her necklace are all removed. She takes her dress off and she's dressed in a very simple plain white garment to symbolize her humility. And she is seated in St. Edward's chair, the coronation chair. The Archbishop of Canterbury then uses holy water to anoint her hands, breast and head while four Knights of the Garter hold a canopy over the chair to kind of shield her from view. You can see this um, ampulla, it's shaped like an eagle. Um, the head comes off of that to put the holy oil in, but the beak also has an opening. So the oil is poured out of that into this spoon. And the spoon at the bottom, this is one of the only pieces left of that medieval regalia uh, that did not get melted down, that was spared um, during the interregnum period. But this is very holy, very important, um, very, a very, very important part of the service. After that, um, she is dressed in uh, a couple of, again, garments that look very clerical. On the left is the super tunica. Um, this is a full length sleeved coat of gold silk and it's um, lined in red silk. Uh, it, it is actually more current. It was made for her father in 1937, but it's very much modeled on the medieval designs. And then over that is the imperial mantle. 
This was made for George IV in 1821. Again, very, both of these garments look very um, clerical, look, look very um, ecclesiastical, um, very religious, and that's purposeful, that's purposeful. And then there's the regalia. Now I mentioned that everything had been melted down and just almost everything destroyed under the interregnum period. So all of this dates back, almost all of this dates back to 1661. First, there's the gold uh, spurs. Um, this dates back to the 1100s. This, this idea of presenting these spurs started under Richard I and they symbolize knighthood and chivalry. Uh, and then you've got, and these were actually, again, made in 1661, obviously. And then you've got the armels. So during the coronation service, these kind of bracelets, um, these armlets are placed on the sovereign's wrists. And they're referred to as bracelets of sincerity and wisdom. And they're thought to relate to ancient symbols of knighthood and military leadership. These are newer. These were actually made for the coronation of Elizabeth II in 1953. They were a gift from the Commonwealth. So they replaced the pair that had been used going all the way back to 1661. The sovereign is then presented with um, two scepters. Um, one is surmounted by a cross, which actually represents the temporal order, not, not the spiritual. And one is surmounted by a dove, the dove on the top, which you can see here. This represents the spiritual role that the sovereign plays. The dove is meant to be the Holy Ghost. And this is known as the rod of equity and mercy. And again, blinged out with some jewels on it. There's that first one I was talking about. Um, this was made in 1685. It had some modifications later on. And it has yet another one of these diamonds, part of that 3,000 um, carat diamond that was found, stone that was found. This is the Cullinan One Diamond, the first star of Africa, it's called. And that's uh, sitting atop, atop of it. The orb, it's a representation of the sovereign's power. It symbolizes the Christian world with, it's got the cross on the top and the globe, it's meant to be a globe. And the bands of jewels that you can see, it divides it into three sections. And that represented the three continents that were known to have existed in medieval times or what they believed existed in medieval times. Again, emeralds, rubies, sapphires, diamonds, pearls, a lot of bling. And here's the coronation ring that I was talking about, the, the uh, ring of kingly dignity or the wedding ring of England. This one was made in 1831 for William IV. Ironically, so this one's always been used for um, coronations. Ironically, the one for Victoria that damaged her finger, hurt her finger, was specially made for her because she had little fingers. But nonetheless, even though it was a you know, ring that was supposed to fit on her finger, the archbishop shoved it on the wrong finger and ended up hurting her instead. This is St. Edward's crown, the, the crown I was talking about, named for Edward the Confessor. It's used at the moment of coronation, not an exact replica of the medieval design, uh, but it does follow the original pattern. Again, blinged out with rubies and sapphires and garnets and topaz and diamonds, you name it. Uh, interesting thing about this crown, until the early 20th century, the stones were rented for the occasion of the coronation and then taken, taken out again. But in 1911, for the coronation of George V, they finally had the crown set with, um, permanently set with these uh, semi-precious stones. As I said, it weighs five pounds. It's really, really heavy. So it is replaced after the crowning um, by the imperial state crown. And then the queen, um, she gets on her imperial state crown. Um, after the crowning, uh, the, the nobles pay um, homage to her. They swear their allegiance. Um, and then the wedding, the, the, uh, the wedding, sorry, the bells of Westminster Abbey ring out. There's a 62 gun salute from the Tower of London. Uh, and then it, this would be the point in the coronation service had it not been a queen, but a king. This is when the anointing and crowning of the queen consort takes place. So next month when Charles has his coronation, after he's enthroned, after the crown is placed on his head, after everyone pays homage to him and the bells ring and the guns fire, then Queen Camilla will have her anointing and her crowning. This imperial robe was made especially for Elizabeth II. It's 21 feet long. It weighs 15 pounds. 
it's kind of harkens back to the imperial uh, robes of the um, Roman emperors. It took 12 seamstresses to make it. Uh, it took them 3,500 hours to complete. And this is what she wore out of the abbey with her imperial state crown. You can see them here working on it. And here is the imperial state crown. Um, she again has used this also for the state opening of parliament. Because it's used so regularly, um, the crown is often replaced. Um, so this one was made for George VI, um, replaced one that was uh, made for Victoria. Again, lots of diamonds, sapphires, emeralds. I think there's like close to 3,000 diamonds in here. Uh, 17 sapphires, 11 emeralds, 269 pearls. It contains some of the most famous jewels in the, um, in the crown jewel collection. These include the Black Prince's ruby, which you can see here in the front, right in the front here. Um, and that one supposedly goes back to um, the mid 1300s. And then there's a sapphire from the Stuart period, another one of those wonking great uh, Cullinan diamonds that you can see down here. Um, and there's the queen leaving the abbey. Oops. Slide not advancing here. And this lovely portrait, a beautiful portrait of her um, by Cecil Beaton, um, holding, wearing the, the imperial crown and her robe. And with her, her maids of honor. Okay, so um, I mentioned queen consorts. So during the coronation ceremony, as I said, the monarch's consort gets some of the same regalia, including a crown. Queen Camilla will be the first queen consort crowned in Westminster Abbey in almost a hundred years. She has chosen to wear the crown made for George V's consort, Queen Mary. So this will be the first time in recent history that an existing crown is used instead of a new one being commissioned for the queen consort. This has not happened since the 1700s, basically. And Westminster, I'm sorry, Buckingham Palace said, well, this is being done in the interest of sustainability and efficiency. So she's kind of recycling, if you will. And she's again, kind of uh, making some changes. I'm not gonna talk about the, uh, the uh, Kulinor, uh, Kulinor um, diamond here. It's a very controversial diamond that was taken from India. And many believe it should be returned to India. Um, that had been used, then it was replaced by a replica. That's being taken out. Doesn't seem politically correct to use it right now. But some of those Conan, um diamonds I talked about um, are going to be placed in there and used and added to um, Queen Camilla's crown. And she's even taking out some of the arches for some reason, removing some of the arches. So her, rank, her, her crown is going to look a little different. Oh, there is the Coronan. All I can really say about that, again, is um, I can talk about that in the Q&A if people want me to, but uh, very controversial um, beliefs that it should be returned to India. It came to uh, England in the 1800s, kind of forced out of India. Uh, but it's controversial because the Indians took it from, you know, the Afghans lay claim to it, Pakistanis lay claim to it. It's got a complicated history. Uh, so Charles, what do we know about Charles? We don't know a lot of him. We know some things about his coronation, but considering how soon it's coming up, they they still haven't shared a whole lot. Uh, we know it's going to take place on Saturday, May 6th. He'll be the 40th monarch that will be crowned in the Abbey. Uh, this is his uh, official logo on the left here. Um, and the first stamp that's been issued with his, his image and not, not wearing a crown, uh, unusually. Uh, the palace said it's going to be a solemn religious service, uh, also a celebration for uh, an occasion for celebration and pageantry. Uh, it'll reflect the monarch's role today and look toward the future while being rooted in longstanding tradition and pageantry. Charles loves tradition um, and pageantry. The ceremony is probably going to be much shorter than his mother's, maybe closer to two hours, but they haven't said. And it's believed he's only going to have around 2,000 uh, guests, not the 8,000 his mother had. But again, nothing official has been said about that. We are told, but not officially from the palace, but supposedly from a pa palace sources, have said that Queen Camilla's grandchildren, their teenagers, will be given an official role in the ceremony, probably the ones who will hold the canopy over her head as she is anointed with holy oil. Um, and there's some supposition that the almost 10-year-old Prince George, son of um, 
Prince William, he may also have a role to play. But again, nothing has been announced. Music has always played a very, very, very important role in coronations. Um, some pieces are permanent fixtures, such as Handel's um, Zeduk the Priest. Um, that's been played at all ceremonies since 1727, and actually uh, Handel's version has been since 1727, but that goes all the way back to Edgar. Um, that was even sung at Edgar's coronation. We know that uh, Charles has commissioned 12 new pieces of music um, using British composers and performers. He's got a new coronation anthem coming from Andrew Lloyd Webber. He's got 11 other pieces, six orchestral, five choral, an organ commission. Um, and in tribute to his late father, Prince Philip, uh, Duke of Edinburgh, he is going to have the Byzantine chant ensemble perform Greek Orthodox music during the ceremony. And then finally, there's going to be three days of celebrations. So you've got the coronation on Saturday. There's going to be this big lunch um, that takes place also on Saturday, kind of community lunches and street parties. That night, uh, the next night, Sunday night, there's going to be a coronation concert. And then on Monday, there is an extra, what they call bank holiday, an extra holiday off work. And what they're encouraging the public to do is go out and volunteer spend that day volunteering. So it's called the big help out and there are going to be opportunities to volunteer in your community. So went way over as I knew I would. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I am going to turn my camera back on and I see that there's one, yeah, one comment in the chat, okay. Um, okay, so does anybody, you can unmute yourselves. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Or thoughts? Yes. Anyone? I remember watching the coronation um, of Elizabeth um, in in 1953, and I'm trying to figure it was it would it have been a film? I know it was the first televised one, but this is kind of pre satellites. So I'm wondering. I remember coming into the um, into the house, and my mother was glued to the TV during the day, which she never would have been. And I asked her what she was watching, and she said it's the coronation. And uh, yeah, I don't know if it would have been being. That's a good question. I don't know. I wasn't born until the following year, so I didn't. <laughs> but I do I don't know if it was beamed live? I don't know how they were transmitting back in the 50s. Either. That's a really good question. I'll have to look into that because I'm not, I'm not sure. My understanding was they said it was watched by 20 million people around the country, I mean, around the world. So I'm assuming there must have been a way to somehow transmit it. But there maybe are a lot of, a lot of films on, on YouTube. And oh, yeah. Yeah. Both are, well. yeah. Yeah, but I don't, I don't know though if it was actually transmitted live to other countries in their own time zone or if it was you got to watch it after the fact, you know, they filmed it and then yeah. shared it with other countries. Good question. Blew, blew the reels of film over to the US or something. Yeah, I well, know. you know, I, really that, know. I, I, I was actually quite impressed when I was in um, Sweden in 2010. Total fluke, not at all planned. I was in Stockholm and it was the, uh, I just happened to be there for the wedding of their crown princess, um, who was much beloved, a much beloved young woman. And it, this was huge. I mean, huge, huge, huge everywhere. Um, so I went over to the palace because I wanted to get some photos. And I did. I managed to the church. And I did manage to get a couple of good shots off. I sat there for hours and hours. But I walked away from there while she was still on the balcony waving to people. Um, and by the time I got to the, to, to the tube station, to the, to the subway station, there were already newspapers with pictures printed of the wedding ceremony. And I'm like, how the heck did they do that? I mean, literally the wedding, the wedding ceremony was maybe four hours prior to the time I was walking over there, but they had somehow managed to get them printed and distributed to, to all, you know, all over the city by then. And I'm like, wow. Yeah. So they probably, they may have flown, they may have had a courier, you know, standing by to fly these things over immediately, but still it took hours to get across the ocean back in the 50s. You know, they didn't have the Concord. So I, I don't know. Yeah. yeah, I'll have to look it up. Not sure. Not sure. Other uh, comments or questions? 
is Deb, absolutely I'm, wonderful presentation. Yes, today. I'm unmuting myself, but not to, not not subjecting you all to my <laughs> face at the moment. Uh, it was really great. You were so knowledgeable. How do you? Uh, how many hours do you?